Peace and blessings, everyone. This is your brother Asar M. Hotep uh, coming to you with a live presentation. And, excuse me, we're going to get things started in a little bit. I'm just going to um, wait a few minutes and seconds uh, for anyone who's going to be live to join in and um let me get my stuff together over here <laughs> what's going on um yes yeah, it's, it's been a minute since i've done a a live on uh this channel so I'm just getting my my stuff in order, and uh, we'll be getting started soon. So uh, peace to everyone who's in the chat already, and uh, who's uh, others who are just viewing live. Again, I'm just uh, starting the chat. Excuse me, starting the um, the live feed, and we will get uh started a little bit they acting while in the in the chat room here um we'll be getting started in a few minutes um today's I'm, I'm trying to reduce the the length of my uh lectures so they're digestible um so today is going to be a little bit short and as the title suggests we're going to be dealing with the uh, Egyptians as a Bantu people. And so this is uh, lesson one of my new text, Aluja Volume 2, which is still on pre-sale um, at this moment, but it, uh, it is at regular price. So this is the uh, uh, text right here. Currently, right now, it's over 560 pages, and um, and another book that's coming out in January is the comparative towards a comparative dictionary of Chicom in modern African languages. So, be on the lookout for that if you haven't gotten this already. And um, so you know, we we're gonna get busy today, and so part of you know. Um, this text here is to demonstrate the relationship between uh, ancient Egypt and Bantu civilizations. And so uh, that's why I subtitled Chiana into religion and philosophy. And so what I what I just uh, what I uh, demonstrate in this text is that Bantu philosophy is Egyptian philosophy. So um, and you'll come to discover uh, how that is the case, you know, um, through all these pages. So, again, if you haven't gotten this text or pre-ordered this text, it comes out January 1st, go to my website, www.asarmhotep.com, and uh, you can purchase it there. And um, after the 1st, it'll be available on Amazon. And um, so, yeah. I think we're good for now. <laughs> uh, peace, peace to Jolanda. Peace to Omar Reed, CK the Poet, Brother David Shah, Brother Chavez, Alkebalon, HVAC, and anyone else uh, who is uh, watching this live. So um, I'm not going to... Uh, Hold on. Uh, <laughs> yes. So uh, for for those, and excuse my speech because I bit my tongue earlier chewing on something I wasn't supposed to. So you may he see me uh, doing this to my cheek, you know, throughout the night. But um, we're just going to get started. So I'm going to switch into share screen mode and 
go to share screen. So I'm going to tie your application. Sharing screen. So while I'm in this, I won't be able to see uh, what's going on in the chat. But let me actually, because I have two computers, uh, my old super slow computer, and then my slightly faster computer, which I'm on. Uh, Do 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 do. Uh, so again, um, the title of this presentation is Aluja Volume Two, Lesson One. And so throughout the year, you'll you'll see me title these like Aluja Volume Two, Lesson Two, Aluja Volume Two, Lesson Three, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, with a, a a different title. And so I'll just be randomly picking. Um, different aspects of the book to to talk about. So what I'm talking about in this particular lecture is going to be um, it's a small part of the introduction, but there's a lot more that is in uh, that introduction. Excuse me, regarding this topic than what I'll be presenting today. So uh, hold on one second. Uh, where's my page? Oh, there we go. Mm. So I see there's been a lot of activity on the net recently. So I'm um, um, been busy, as y'all know. Uh, uh, just give me one second. Um, getting things in order on this other computer. Uh, I'll just pause that. Okay. This way I can at least... Uh, see the the chat a little bit I think uh, okay so Hatep everyone peace okay okay now I'm gonna get busy no no more delay okay so again uh, Aluja volume 2 lesson 1 the Egyptians called themselves Bantu now uh, for, for those of you who have been uh, keeping up with me over the years know that I constantly get into these debates with individuals because I choose to do a lot of cross comparisons between the ancient Egyptian language and culture with that of modern Bantu languages and cultures. And people get in their feelings because they feel that for some odd reason that we're not supposed to do this. And here's one of the reasons why I can. Um, the Egyptians called themselves Bantu. Now, they didn't use the word Bantu in that pronunciation, which you'll see how it is related in, uh, in a few moments. So, as I stated, you know, uh, what, what I'm presenting here is in this book, uh, Aluja Volume 1, excuse me, Aluja Volume 2, China into Religion and Philosophy, which you can get at the uh, at the website, www.asarimhotep.com. So we'll just get started with the theoretical framework. So what do we mean by Bantu? <clears throat> as far as the languages are concerned, Bantu are the speakers of the N2 languages. And this is just, um, i am just swiped this from uh, Wikipedia. Uh, comprising several hundred indigenous ethnic groups in sub-Saharan Africa spread over a vast area from Central Africa across the Great African Lakes 
to Southern Africa. So the Bantu people are a group of people who speak in two languages. And so here's an example of a Bantu speaking people, uh, the Chiluba people in um, Central Africa, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And um, I should have uh, juxtaposed this with an image where in ancient Egypt, you'll see the same type of uh, beatery uh, across the chest like this uh, for performers. And uh, that would have been a good slide to present to y'all. But the Bantu classification was coined by Wilhelm Heinrich Emanuel Bleek by 1863. He noted that all of the languages in Central and South Africa use the stem into to refer to person or man. And this is uh, Bleak uh, right here, Wilhelm Bleak, as we, as, as we see him. So where did the word Bantu come from? The word Bantu for the language families and its speakers is an artificial term based on reconstructed proto into term for people or humans. So there's no ethnic group of people called Bantu. It's just a, a label that is, paced, that is placed upon a group of languages that are related to each other. Um, it was introduced again by Wilhelm Bleek in 1857 or 1858 and popularized in his comparative grammar of 1862. The name was coined to represent the word for people. So this word here, Bantu, means people. Um, and is loosely reconstructed uh, for proto into from the plural noun class prefix ba, categorizing people and a root into some entity, any entity or thing. So, like in the Amazulu language, you say amuntu for a singular person, abantu in the plural for people, into for thing, isintu for things. So you you see that the root is this into into. As, as we can see here. And so it's so when you say by into, you're saying people thing, people objects or people beings, because like into really is a word for um, being as such. And so we continue. So Bleak's coinage was inspired by the anthropological observation of groups self-identifying as people or true people. That is, idiomatically, the reflexes of Bantu in the numerous languages often have connotations of personal character traits as encompassed under the value systems of Ubuntu, also known as Hunhu in Chishona or Bolto in Sesotho, rather than just referring to all humans. So there's a uh, so one thing um, Bleak noticed again that when the people refer to themselves. They refer to themselves as some variation of Muntu or Bantu or Intu. And that this was in relationship to this phenomenon, this uh, philosophy called Ubuntu, uh, which is like the, the art of being human. And, um, and so, you know, when you review that text, uh, you know, it goes into a little bit more detail. So when we go to ancient Kemet, uh, the ancient Kemets were the, were the same way. So just like how you saw amongst the, um, the Bantu people in Central and South Africa, when they named themselves the people, the ancient Egyptians named themselves the people as well. But they used a word um, that we, we pronounce as remetch. That is our Egyptology speak, remetch. And so you can see uh, this is from the Ramesses third tomb, uh, the word here, Remetch. So this, these, these people are identified as the Remetch and you can see the glyphs, uh, right here, the R and the T, the M was omitted. And then the, uh, classifiers, uh, right here. So this is a little bit more clear. So the word for person in Chicam 
is Middle Egyptian is remetch. Remetch can be singular for man. It can also mean people in the plural. In Coptic, you would say Rome or Lome, which means man, husband. Um, a, a reflex of this word in the Chiluba Bantu language in Central Africa is Lume, male, masculine. Mulume, uh, husband, man. And Chilume, sperm. So we can see from ancient Egypt all the way to modern Bantu, they have the same word for person uh, or, or male. And this is and this is one variation of how the word is written in the actual hieroglyphs. And so you normally you will see this phrase remetch and kemet. And it means the people of Kemet. So this is how they fully identify it with themselves. So it's not just the people, it's the people of Kemet. And so here's another variation uh, from this variation that we saw. Uh, up here of the word remetch. But <laughs> what I'm proposing to you today is that the word remetch and the word bantu are the exact same word. And that um, you will have to do some linguistic exercises to understand how they relate. And so when I was doing uh, my research for this and doing my experimentation, there was uh, one researcher who came the closest to solving the problem of the origin of the word remetch. And that was Dr. Alan Anselin, who, who passed this year. Um, he's out of the Caribbean. He had a journal and um, you know, he's done a lot of work, you know, comparing ancient Egyptian to modern African languages um, of, the, of the French speaking world. And so in this text that I'm, that I'm citing here is titled uh, The Words of Geno, Full Bay, Cushitic, Nilot, Nilots, and Ancient Egyptians. <laughs> and I translated this from French. So it's originally in French. Um, but he, he gives a uh something that we can build with that that we would discover that he he was uh correct in some ways and in the text in the Lucia volume two i demonstrate where he went wrong in other ways but in the full full day language he has rim as a as a verb born uh in gender rim go to have a young ones substantive dim key plural of demo in a pular rimde in gender sier remit child ramal plural tamal aak now birth parentage verb to give birth to a baby or other young uh dimfo tima childbirth in uh, sier lim as many west african forms echoes that of the eastern cushitic rim uterus Somali Rame uterus, Oromo Rim pregnant, uh, Burji Ramayakaf become pregnant in terms of cattle. And so, what gave me, uh, when I was looking at the, fu the, the Fulani, that's uh, the, the full full day here, uh, just another way of saying Fulani. When, when I was looking at the Fulani language, it gave me a clue as to how to solve the problem because let's go back up for a moment so notice that when we say remetch in middle egyptian that it has this t this type of this uh palletized t here so that's why we say remetch but notice in coptic and notice in chiluba that chi is missing so the question is what happened to this and where did it come from and what does it mean? So, you know, again, a Coptic, Rome, Lome, and Chiluba, Lume, Mulume, and I give more examples across Africa. And the vast majority of them don't have this ch at the end of the of the word. So where where did this come from and what does it mean? So that was the question that I was uh, seeking to ask 
excuse me, seeking to answer. So we'll go back. So <laughs> when I looked in the Fulani uh, language, in the, especially in the Furdu dialect, I noticed a pattern. And so in let's let's look at these examples real real quick. So we have Sir Day to smoke to make smoke, and then we have Kirki or Sir Key smoke. This day at the end of Sir is a verbal suffix. But notice what I have here in red. Key smoke. It deverbalizes the verb and makes it into a noun. And for those who don't know, the that ch t sound in ancient Egyptian it derives from key. So at some point in the um, the history of the ancient Egyptian language, the the remetch was pronounced something like remet key. Because it's the key that turned into the ch sound. So we see this in, in this other word here, tunkide or tunkunde, to be quiet still. Tinki mek, very quiet. Again, turning the verbs into nouns. Well day, to be sweet, to be sharp. Labi mbelki, a sharp knife. Yide, to love, to desire. In jiki love, as in, you know, an abstract now. So we see this pattern, and we notice the same pattern, the same feature in the Egyptian language. So let's look at this. So sifi to mix, which is a verb. Then you have safetch, one of seven sacred oils. Zareb, to flow, to drip. Sera, to flow. This is reduplication. And so here it has a B suffix, and here is reduplicated without the suffix, to flow. Seret, water on a sacrificial plate. Zed, to linger, to creep. Zereha, to reach, to arrive at, to place. But then Zeret, Cargo boat, tow boat, heri to milk, erit milk, as in the noun milk, and then see this other variant, eriti, belonging to milk, sucking calf. So we see the same pattern of the ch sound that nominalizes a verb. So what this tells us is that the word remetch, the, the RM part, um, is a verb. And that the ch is a fossilized suffix for the word remetch in Middle and Old Kingdom Egyptian. So also when you notice the... Um, the examples given by Dr. Anselin, you saw words for like uterus, body parts, um, to impregnate, things to that nature. And from my studies in African languages, I know there's a pattern, there's a semantics that uh, exists. And that is that words for body parts become words for genitalia and then genitalia becomes words for to impregnate to produce and then those words become words for people and we're going to see the same thing happen here in um, the egyptian language so <laughs> and i'm going to show you how we get from this this word these words here to the word remetch there's a linguistic feature that y'all gonna have to pay attention to. So we have zemeri, a part of the body. And so this is a suffix for body parts. You see in this one, zemer, lung. And then you say zemeri, testicles. 
semitic scalp temple of the head and so for those who are familiar with the language know that the z became s or merged with s uh in the old kingdom and so <laughs> so remember what i said words for body parts then become words for people so With Zimu, a part of the human body, remit, uh, remit, a part of the body, testicles. And you have remin, shoulder. Notice what happens here. This Z sound turns into R. And I have this marked here. Z becomes R in between two vowels. So this is how we go from zimerti, testicles, lung, etc., part of the body, to uremet, a part of the body, testicles, etc., etc. Because of this particular feature, this particular sound change. So remember what I said, that the word for body comes to mean a body part meaning like um, uh, testicles or you know vagina etc to copulate with and then you have here zemech head chief master and you should know that the word remech it first and foremost means a male like a human male and so the chief, the head, master, etc., is the male. So this is this is the older form. So hopefully y'all will get exactly what I'm showing you here. And so this is the evolution of the word remetch. So zimir, with zimu, where remet, remetch, from zimetch. And so notice that when this W is in front of z it now because there's a vowel in between the w and the m that surrounds the z and it's it and it's because of being in that uh, phonetic environment that it rhoticizes the z and turns it into a r so that's how we get the word remetch so hopefully you know, y'all are getting this. Um, so let me know if y'all can still uh, hear me and all that good stuff in the chat room. Uh, hold on. So I'm going to continue. Um, hold on one second. Just making sure that everything is still live. Cool beans. Alrighty. So, <laughs> so, you know, the phenomenon which I just explained, again, is called rhoticism. So, this is from the book Historical Linguistics and the Comparative Study of African Languages by Dr. Garrett Divendal. So, he says, rhoticism is a common sound change affecting the coronal alveolar or past alveolar, post alveolar uh, pre palatal fricatives. Thus, S be may become R often through an intermediate voicing stage of Z or by way of a retroflex voice R, or voiceless R. This change occurred in Germanic languages as in German Verlerin. Uh, which is cognate with English, lose, and a range of other uh, families. So this this rhoticism, as you can see here, is from from S or Z to R. And so I'm just going to give another example that you find in the ancient Egyptian language. So many of you may be familiar with the word Rick Rick, a hostile snake or Rick, a hostile serpent, but it comes from Zik Zik, a snake that you can see here. 
again, it's telling us that there's there's two vowels, one in front of the Z and one after the Z, which facilitates the rhoticism. And so in Campbell, 1998, he defines rhoticism exclusively as a change in which S or Z becomes R. Usually this takes place between um, uh, vowels of glides, as I mentioned. So we can see another example here in a Sumerian language. Habiz, air. Then Habira, sun. Ibila, air. So notice here that when Habiz is not followed uh, by a trailing vowel, the Z remains. But as soon as a vowel is behind uh, the Z, it turns into R, which then turns into L. So I hope I'm making sense. So as I stated, the fundamental pattern is body part, genitalia, man. So you can see it in this other uh, example in the ancient Egyptian for the semantics. Mit, which is this glyph here for phallus, and then mit, wit, semen, son. And so you can see in other ways that the word for body or body part becomes the word for people or person. So you have h here, body of an animal. You have h people, belly, womb, body, sole of a foot, ship's bilge. h belly of the gods of men, group of people, troop. h group, body of the gods of man, generation, people, troop. A generation, mass of a substance. So remember, um, I think I go into this in the book, that this H is a root, the, the, the very root that becomes the R or the Z in the word uh, Zemed or Remech, and also the J sound. But I'm, I won't get into that because I want to try to keep it simple uh, for tonight. So... Uh, this is taken directly from Aluja Volume 2. And so what, what I do is I give some examples in ancient Egyptian and um, some other languages where the word for um, to bear or to give birth becomes the word for person. So you can see that this is a pattern in African languages. So it is this same grammatical morpheme that turns the verb and I'm talking about the T because the ch sound merges with the, the T in, um, in Middle Egyptian. So it, it becomes the suffix of T that nominalizes verbs. So we can see here in this, this word here, pa pa, to bear, to be born. When the T suffix is added, it's the word, the people, humankind, patricians. I said the notion that a human is he or, or she who is born or the one who bears can be found across a myriad of African languages. For example, in collagen, we have the word of the root E, bear, give birth. Also pronounced ye, give birth, procreate, have children, bear, beget, bread, bring forth. This root is in the word boyisik adults men mature people so it just has uh some prefixes and suffixes on here and it becomes the word for adults men mature and people just like we see in ancient egyptian in the wolof language we had the word gin phallus and then we have guine agone adolescent or a child in egyptian we have peri to copulate with to fertilize then when the T suffix is added, it becomes a word for human beings, men, women. Er, to beget. A word to conceive to be pregnant. Ereru, human beings. So word to be pregnant. In Sumerian, we have pesh, to give birth, to be pregnant, pregnancy. Pesh, descendant, grandson, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll just leave this up a little while so you know when you review this text you can go back and um 
and and pause the video so you can read it on your own but this 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 exact paragraph is in eluja volume two so again i just wanted to show the pattern the pattern is to to bear to be born to procreate and then human being that's the semantics and so <laughs> the the word into again as i argue is a variant of the word uh remetch or the the rm in remetch and the it's the t sound that becomes d becomes l becomes r in various african languages and the n in the word into is what we call this prefix of agent it, it lets you know that uh, the root of the word itself refers to a particular agent somebody that's animate and when this prefix of agent is followed by the u sound then this can um uh what's the word i want to use uh morph into the m sound that you see in in like uh muntu or something like that so uh you know the word muntu or bantu in a singular for a human being has a cognate in the hasa language and so this this ngu which becomes m can be prefixed or suffixed in these african languages so in in hasa it is both prefixed and suffixed to the root two and so one is fossilized and one is the the more modern active variant meaning man or male and so this word too even though they say it means entity or being it's just a word for body or body part so as we can see in these proto-bantu reconstructions this this word too is present in the word for body in the word for head in the word for ear in the word for servant or person and so uh i'm gonna go to a text that's real important you really can't see this image but this is reverend w wagner's comparative lexical study of sumerian and into bantu and he did uh some very important work in the early 1930s and 1935 uh comparing the sumerian language to bantu languages of uh, central and south africa especially the amazulu language and so from his text he says this and this is going to be very important for understanding the relationship between the word Rome, Lume, Chilum, and the word Muntu, Into. So, um, and and everything that he states here is verifiable. So when, when he's talking about the root Into, this is what he has to say. He says, some points need noting beforehand. One is that while in Sumerian, Mu, and G denoted man in the sense of virility, into and in Chibantu, Mu and Ki with their variants go both ways, although they mostly stand for homo, person. The second is this. We dispense once more with the class prefix or the determinative idea, restoring to Mu its ancient character as, as component of equal standing with Lu, Ru, into and so on a third point regards the into replicas of sumerian mulu into muru is almost literally identical with it the variant muntu is apt to claim special interest since bantu or into have been adopted as designation of an immense family of peoples and languages when i wrote the first volume of my science of the zulu grammar that is, at a time when I was not ex professo engaged in comparative lexical study, I already thought it not beyond the limits of possibility that the stem of Ubuntu is but another form of 
person, Lu, that is of Sumerian Lu man. Since then, the possibility has turned into an established fact. A fourth point, I proceed from Sumerian Mulu. It will be found that in the course of proposing its variance, the Sumerian words for man turn up in identical or varied form. At the same time, it should be borne in mind that the Sumerian M and Ng forms are phylologically identical. This, this symbol here is like an N and a G uh, pronounced simultaneously. It's Ng. Wherefore, Ng of Sumerian Ngash may well be replaced by into M, so that Nga Ngash reappears as into as Ma. So, what he's saying here is that the the root into the two part is cognate with the word Lu in Sumerian, and if you know in Sumerian, um, you can say the word person as Lu, Mulu or lume or dume. So as I mentioned before, like just like how we saw in Hasa, the mu uh, affix is, is both prefixed and suffixed in related languages. And you see the same thing in Sumerian. So what I note in the uh, in Illusion Volume 2, continuing Wagner's uh, conversation starting on page 143, is that Sumerian Mulu finds its inverse in Chibantu in the following forms. So this is what Wagner is saying now. Lumu, Lumi, Lume, Luma, Lum, Madumu, Umu, Tum, Zoom, Um, Nungu, Shungu, Rumi, Dumi, Lume, uh, Lume, Indu, Ume, Rume, Rume, Indu, Dume, Nume, Num, Lunga, etc. Given that Urum is a dialectical form of Mulu in Sumerian, Murum, Urum, Mulum, Mulu, and Urum is cognate with Middle Egyptian Remetch, and Mulu is a variant of Muntu, then Remetch is a variant of Muntu in the reverse. Thus, Muntu, Intum, Rum, Rumki, Remetch. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping y'all can see the pattern here. So the, the very forms that, you, that we saw, like in Chiluba, in Coptic, etc., is found all over the Bantu sphere, even in the Sumerian language. And so when you say remetch, it literally is a word meaning Bantu or Muntu. It's just a different dialectical variation, just like um, that we see in these di different Bantu dialectical variations. And so given that the phrase remetch in Kemet that we mentioned earlier, remember that the word remetch comes from a, a, a root meaning to be born, to be engendered. We can reinterpret this phrase to be those who are born of Kemet, therefore the indigenous of Kemet. And this better explains the, the ethnonym and, and how it applied to the, the ancient Egyptians. And so it's those born of Kemet, the indigenous. And so um, I end there. And um, I hope I made sense and that the presentation was short and to the point. And that uh, y'all understood uh everything that I had to say. So, excuse me. Um, woo. I'm trying to catch up in the chat uh, to see if any of y'all have any questions based upon um, uh, hold on. I'm getting used to this stream yard uh, back panel. Um, so uh, again, just checking the chat. Uh, yeah, CK the Poet, I will try to do more of these shows, uh, more educational shows and more interviews. So I'll, I'll be having some interviews with some uh, some some well-renowned scholars 
so that y'all can hear more than my voice uh, on this channel. So uh, let me see. And I know there's going to be a time delay, so I'm trying to give y'all uh, time to, to hear it. And, you know, if you have any questions that you want to formulate, you know, let me know. And I'm not seeing any questions per se. Um, so I'll just leave that there. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's not, it's, it's not difficult. Um, you know, uh, the, the information is just, you know, you just kind of pay attention. So knowing, knowing what rhoticism is and the, the, the phonetic environment will help you to trace, uh, the word rematch. Uh, Jolanda said in Boli. Um, I assume you're asking in the context of possibly interviewing him in the future. Um, we probably will because he's working on a book and um, I assume he's going to release it this year. So around the time that he releases it, we'll probably do another interview with him. Um, 42 tribes ask, I'm curious as to how you think Sumerian relates to Indo-European. Um, I think it is a far, far distant relative, but only in the sense that um, Sumerian is uh, a, you, you know, my redefining of the Negro Egyptian language family. So it is a Chiena into language, but Chiena into languages had influence in the development of Indo-European. So it's not an Indo-European language. It's not relatable in that way, but th they are a part of a group that uh, ended up in the Middle East in, in ancient times and, and helped to influence the formation of the language through convergence. So uh, hopefully that makes sense. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to see if there's any more questions. If not, I am going to end. Hold on, what we got here? Um, so why is Garfield saying that West Africans have aren't the same as the ancient uh, Kikama. Um, I think he is saying in the sense that in terms of our recent history, in terms of our collective history, that the, the West Africans have a distinct language and culture from the ancient Egyptians. And everyone wants to attach themselves to the ancient Egyptians, not understanding that the these other African cultures are just as great and just as powerful, um, even without the necessarily monuments that have been built. But ultimately, these these cultures are related, language wise. Uh, they come from the same sources, etc., from the people. So they're relatable. It just depends on what time period you're uh, you're talking about so if you're talking about from like 1441 when the um the portuguese took the first uh africans from west africa into spain no that's a different set of people than the ancient egyptians but if we go back a little further then you see that there's they have a common origin so i hope that makes sense there's any other questions uh, put it in the chat now and 
I'll try to uh, wait a minute or so for uh, the time delay. And, you know, I forgot what the second lesson is going to be. I'll probably do it next week, uh, next weekend or so. Okay. Uh, CK, the poet says he has a question, so I'll just wait for you to type it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Lume, Mulume, and Uncle, and uh, Isikosa. Okay, uh, I'm going to do these one at a time. So, uh, Anthony Harris asks, what's the best book to purchase in order to study the language of ancient Egypt. Um, I would wait on Brother Wu Jawu's. Uh, he's working on a grammar book. I know he has an introductory book on, um, you know, learning the basic hieroglyphs and things of that nature. And, uh, and I know he's working on a grammar book now. Um, so if he's still in the chat, uh, he should be able to tell you when it is going to uh, uh, to come out. You know, so I, I think it's coming out in 2020. So I would get with him, and uh, so I, I would start off with Wujawu's text uh, on on the introduction into the hieroglyphs, and then his second book uh, dealing with the grammar, and so. I see that he's in the chat now. Uh, he says, do you mind give us a list of the oldest languages in Africa? And I also have a follow-up question. Okay. Um, there's really no way to date a language. And all modern languages are modern. And so you, you can't say that this one's older than you know, any other language because they're all contemporary languages. So um, all I can say is that the oldest written language would would be that of the ancient Egyptian. So uh, that's that's a hard question to answer. <laughs> uh, peace, Brother Mathis. Um, Sarah Jahuti asks, are you going to put this presentation in your archive so we can listen to it later. Only ask because I missed your previous presentation. Yeah, it should automatically be in the archives uh, once it is done. Um, so also I wanted to ask, are there any other writing systems in Africa outside of what the Egyptians were writing during their time? Um, Africans had different ways of writing, but they they didn't have an elaborate system at the time that the ancient Egyptians were writing in the way that the ancient Egyptians were writing. Um, and so, you know, you had ways of carving, you know, uh, statues that was, was writing the ways that you would sew patterns in the, in the clothing and techniques like that. They use that as a type of writing, even tying knots, the way that they would tie knots. That's how they would send messages, you know, back and forth. But in in more relatively recent history, there's been a, a, a slew of of African scripts, like the Ndombe script out of um, out of the Congo. You have the Indebele script. Um, there's a lot of scripts coming out of Africa, and so ancient Egypt isn't the only place that has uh, writing in Africa. So I, I will look into those writing scripts, uh, and there's the Gaya script coming out of Ethiopia, you know, it's, it's a whole bunch. Of course, the Marotic script uh, coming out of the Sudan. So um, I, I will look into those. Let me see. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm seeing uh, Brother Bujawu is currently ans an answering the question of, of the text I recommended. So uh, for those who aren't in it, don't have the benefit of the chat, the uh, he said the approximate date is April of 2020. Uh, ancient Egyptian orthography and grammar, a synchronic descriptive grammar of the oldest speech of Kemet. So, uh, so that's the title of the text. So uh, look for an approximate date in April of 2020. <laughs> uh, Lionel Joseph, he says, Hotep, brother, excellent presentation. Getting ready to take up lessons with Dr. Riketi Amin's program. Any tips for a newbie on the best way to approach the lessons? Um, the, the best advice that I can give is to treat the, the learning of the MetaNetra script like you would do mathematics. Mathematics is something that you have to do. Just sit there and practice just all day, just copy stuff all day, you know. And so the more that you practice and memory, you know, it will help in your memorization. It's just just every day, you know, like wake up in the morning, do your prayers and, and, and do a page of practicing. Next thing you know, you'll be, you know, you, you'll be surprised at how much you learn. It's just a matter of practice. That's it. It's not that difficult when, when you really think about it. Um, it's just a matter of practice. That's all. So let's see if there's any uh, any any other question. So I got about uh, three three or four minutes left. Try to keep this under an hour. If there's no more questions. I will end this program. And again, uh, for those who are just coming, uh, Aluja Volume 2, uh, Chiana into Religion and Philosophy. So today's lesson, um, it, you know, came directly from the introduction chapter. And that was just a small segment. And what, what I put on the, the screen today was just bits from there so there's there's actually more uh in the text so and thank you all for those who have uh pre-purchased and um you know working diligently to get these out to you as soon as possible and so uh be on the lookout for these in your your mailbox and again also working on a text towards a comparative dictionary of Chikam in modern African languages. And uh, what's unique about this text is uh, I've compiled a lot of my language comparisons and, and put them in one text with some additional chapters that originally was going to go in here, but um, it would have been too much to print. So I took those two chapters out and put them in here. And I'm thinking of adding another chapter. Uh, I'm just trying to find this, these one comparisons that I've done. Um, and, and so the objective is I want to start organizing and developing a software database to do online comparisons uh, with other African languages. So the, the dictionary dictionary will not be a physical book. It will be online. And so that's, that's what I discuss here, but just laying out the premises for, you know, how we compare and how do we determine what is a cognate or not in these other African languages. So, uh, and I do some comparison between Sumerian, for example, and, uh, and Marotic. So I have a chapter here doing a comparison between Semitic and Marotic. That is uh, be very surprising to those who, um, you know, enjoy that type of work. 
but yeah, this is also available on my website. So uh, let me jump back in the chat. Uh, he says, how come no African people claim to be relatives of the ancient Egyptians? Where are they? Um, there, there are people that I know in Sudan and even in Egypt living today who, who claim to be relatives. But again, um, if you're looking for relatives, um, you know, in far off places in Africa, they're relatives in the, in the ancient historical sense. So they're not going to have necessarily memories uh, of being relatives of the ancient Egyptians. It don't quite work that way. However, in the introduction, I discuss uh, a few of the migrations of, you know, uh, the ancient Egyptians, some going to Senegal, and then I discuss the, the collagen people coming out of, um, uh, through the Sudan into Kenya. And so you, you'll, you'll have the sources on, on that material in the text. So there are some people who do have memory uh, of, of being related to the ancient Egyptians and um, their, their stories were written down in the early 1900s. <laughs> so that's documented in the text. Uh, let me see. Yes, the book is thick. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it would have been a lot smaller, but the half of the book is dedicated to addressing Dr. Wesley Muhammad. So um, chapters, what is it, 8 through 13 is addressing Dr. Wesley Muhammad. So I don't know if you can see here. Response to Wesley Muhammad, 2017. So that's half of the book right there. You know, so, yeah, it, it's it's not a quick read. It, it's going to it's going to be a minute. And this and this book is eight and a half by 11. So it's not as it's, it's thick and it's big. So. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I give you all some content for a while. Because after this book, um, I'm, I'm switching gears. Uh, as y'all know, I'm back in school for computer science, and I have to focus on my computer science work. So it's back to mathematics, coding, all that good stuff. So I got I to gotta leave Africana Studies alone for a minute. So let me see. Uh, let me see. Okay. Um, I don't see anything else. Uh, so I, uh, appreciate all of you. Um, end it now. So I have hit the, the hour mark. And so I want to keep this short and digestible. So I appreciate you know, all of you for uh, for tuning in. Uh, I promise you there will be more shows and I'll keep them digestible within an hour uh, as promised. So thank you all for, um, who are in chat. Uh, thank you all who are just listening and thank you all who are uh, listening as a result of the archive. And um, y'all have a happy new year. I'll see y'all in 2020. And uh, God bless y'all. Good night.